PJ Starks, right? PJ Starks. Yes. So, uh, Cauldron Cauldron Boyle is uh, a podcast that I started uh, last year, but it's just kind of for fun. Um, had a couple actors from all over, you know, mainly out of California, um, who were in Bone Jangles. Uh, we're on here, and we got a couple new ones coming up, and you're the perfect guest to kind of revitalize my podcast because you got a lot of <laughs> projects coming up. And uh, from my conversations with you, uh, you're a pretty uh, interesting guy. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so where you, where are you based out of? Uh, Owensboro, Kentucky. Owensboro, Kentucky. Yes. So how how far is that away from like Hopkinsville? Uh, I'm. You would ask me a locations question. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm awful with uh, <laughs> with directions. I can tell you we are about two and a half hours away from Louisville. <laughs> I'm I'm 43 <clears throat> minutes away from Evansville, Indiana. So I mean, the reason why I ask is because obviously one of my segments that I directed for um, Cryptids mm-hmm. takes, supposedly takes place in Hopkinsville. Well, it's a you know the urban legend of you know the hopskinsville goblin so i thought right. you know you're pretty close down there but i mean <laughs> maybe not you you could be like five minutes away and you might not even know that's true i probably am <laughs> <laughs> i'm about 10 minutes away from whitesville kentucky <laughs> um Honestly, I've never heard that urban legend. I have heard of the – we're near a place called Spotsville, okay. and su- supposedly there's there's what's called the Spotsville Monster, which um, I've been – it's basically Bigfoot. Okay. Um, I mean it's had a couple other little incarnations, but it's mainly Bigfoot. Well, I mean that's kind of a good segue into – so Volumes of Blood, right? I mean that was – is that – your first feature that you've done, and now you've that's kind of transitioned into Volumes of Blood, the, sec, the sequel. What have, what uh, what films have you worked on, or done, or directed, written, produced? Uh, well, I started doing this seriously about ten years ago. Um, my first feature was called Hallow's Eve Slaughter on Second Street. And um, originally, it was based on a on a there's a there's a church near here that's been turned into a uh, or it's here in town. It's actually near where I'm I'm in my office right now. And uh, anyway, there was a there's this urban legend about the church where the daughter of the priest got pregnant and he pushed her away, so she hung herself in the bell tower, and then uh, he ended up getting so depressed because he blamed himself that he hung himself in the basement. And, <laughs> We thought, you know, this would be a great idea to do, you know, like a ghost story about it. Well, we ended up changing venues. We got we uh, at the eleventh hour when we were actually we'd already gone through all of our pre-production. We were getting ready to start shooting, and and the the guys that ran the the venue kind of pulled us aside and said, "Yeah, we're going to make you pay for it, and and actually the movie's going to be ours once you're done, so you can only screen it once." at this location and we control it afterwards and we were like thanks but no thanks and walked away so um, we ended up shooting it at a local haunted like Halloween attraction Mm -hmm. and it became this uh, it went from this ghost story ghost story kind of a thing and I completely revamped the script and it became like an adult version of (laughs) Scooby-Doo where there was a paranormal a group of paranormal investigators who were brought in to prove that there's a ghost in this supposedly haunted Halloween attraction and uh, there ends up being like a slasher hiding in the walls kind of a thing and people start getting killed and and anyway so that that was my very first foray into making like a serious horror venture Um, and then it it kind of bounced back and forth with reviews and uh, the very first review it ever got was like really, really bad. Um, probably the worst review I've ever gotten. It was just this constant punch in the balls, and uh, uh, I can I, I can like there were certain quotes that even I remember now. It's it was like uh, lots of blood and quirky music do not make you Tarantino. Mm. So 
um, then move like we ended up getting more reviews and and uh, they they kind of bounced around from like you know the one sided characters and some of the writing wasn't all that interesting and this that and the other so I was like well I'm gonna prove myself and I did like a psychological drama and uh, it did it did fairly well it pl- it screened in like uh, Times Square in New York City and and places like that and it did uh, it it got really really good reviews but my um my true love is horror so i went right back yeah. into horror yeah. and um and so i started to do my next project that didn't really pan out unfortunately i got really discouraged and then i became kind of like a uh a glorified wedding planner i started doing lots of like events and things but that did the good thing that came from that was i ended up creating this local event called unscripted mm. and uh uh, essentially, it's where uh, local regional filmmakers come in. They screen their short films, and then I'm a big um, like audio commentary fanatic. I love listening okay. to audio commentaries. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, you know, how cool would it be if you know instead of sitting at home listening to the director talk about their film where it's pre-recorded, what if you could sit right next to the director and they could talk about the film? right there in front of you and if you don't like what they're saying you could interrupt them and change the topic and you know you could kind of interact with the filmmaker and 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 uh, push the conversation to another area however it works out and so I, I went and I came up with this idea I pitched it to the library and they loved it so they said hey we'll give it a shot and then uh, we had its first first series which was January and February of uh, 2013, and it was uh, a really big hit for them. It was a free event, and there was popcorn and drinks. And so the uh, so so the director screens the movie once, and then does like a brief Q and A, and then sits with the audience, and they watch the movie a second time. Oh. And the director uh, conducts a live audio commentary. Nice. And that part became really really popular and it drew people back every time and i mean we had there was one weekend where we ended up having upwards of 80 people show up and that and for them that was a really big deal so um it has since become an annual event it's still going on at the library i've stepped away from it at this point they they've taken it over um because i'm focusing mainly on doing film projects and things yep but uh, but after that, I also worked on trying to start up a a, a, a film festival here, and it became it was like a it was like a biannual kind of a thing, and um, I mean trying to put a festival together is extreme. It's extensive. It's very uh, uh, you know there's there's a lot that goes into it, and it's just. It's not really what my passion was, so mm-hmm. we, I got it as far and as big as I could possibly get it. We had it at the local convention center. It was the last time Peter Weller was our big guest, and um, I mean that was really cool. But it just, it just that's not really where my passion uh, lied. So I decided that I was going to go back and start doing more film, and then um, because of that, uh, Unscripted was still going on. And they really wanted to do something different with it, try something new. So we kind of – we collaborated on what was called the Unscripted Film School, and the idea behind that was we open up a registration, and we – for the first for the first go-around, we said we'll shoot two short films simultaneously in the library, and then we opened up a registration in the community for anyone who's interested – and wants to be a part of independent filmmaking and see what it takes, they can come in, they can be a part of that. Um, so we opened it up, and you know it got tons of uh, responses, and and uh, so we we did that. It was a contest, so the the filmmaker it was two local filmmakers were directing, and mm-hmm. we got local uh, professional semi and semi professional crew members to come in and do camera and sound and all that. And uh, so the, those who came in from the outside, like in the community through the registration process, got to shadow the different um, crew members, and that gave. It, so it was also like a learning opportunity. It gave them a chance to to uh, you know see what each person did, and and anyway, so that that was a success. And then um, they immediately wanted to do it again. Um, so 
I started, but they wanted to do something a little different, so I started racking my brain, and I had been wanting to do an anthology for a really long time. And there were a couple um, ideas I'd had in the past, or I, try, I tried to get one going once before, and it didn't really coalesce because we couldn't get our schedules working. And, and uh, so anyway, so the whole thing had to tie into a library because that was the location. So literally when I was at work, supposed to be working, instead I came up with <laughs> the, the concept for what – is volumes of blood i mean that was even the title the original title was because it all tried i had to tie it all into a library so the idea was is this the unscripted film school gave me the opportunity to be able to um you know produce that anthology i'd been wanting to do for so long and it was the same situation where we were going to open up a registration process so all the production assistants would be people from the outside coming in so it was still a learning experience um but what I did was I reached out to all my friends who had done horror films or had dabbled in that genre. Um, and then like with Nathan Thomas Milliner, that we, we were friends at that point, but we never really had an opportunity to work together. So that gave us the, the opportunity to be able to do that. And um, so instead of shooting the shorts simultaneously on the same night, um, my idea was you know we would shoot – uh, a series of short films over a period of time and then it would all culminate to be a feature film when it's all said and done. So that's what we did. We shot volumes of blood over a period of four months okay. and then premiered it in October. No, 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 no. I take that back. It was, uh, it was Friday the 13th was the premiere of 2015. Okay. And then, so of not, course, that led in the sequel. No, it really isn't. It, um, you know, it, ha- it it happened really, really fast. There, I mean, there was a lot of pre-production. Um, I'm not, sh- I'm not sure if you have have um, how how much experience you have with anthologies, but they are a logistical nightmare. So they're especially when you're. Um, when you're bringing in different people from all over the place, mm-hmm. um, you know it's if you're if you're making a film and you're bringing people, you know it's just one single narrative, yeah. And then you have the same kind of continuing characters throughout the whole thing. Um, I mean, it can be tough, but but it makes it a little bit easier because you're only dealing with with a certain amount of people, mm-hmm. a very specific crew, and that kind of a thing. But with the first volumes of Blood, I mean, we were bringing people from from all over the area. I mean, it had a cast of uh, twenty to thirty, I think, is what the, what it was originally, and and um, and we we had we brought in one director from uh, I want to say North Dakota. Maybe it was John Kenneth Muir. He's written some horror horror books. He wrote a book about John Carpenter, and and uh, so he he's really made a name for himself in the in the as a writer. But uh, but I, he was actually a friend of one of the other producers who worked at the library, and that's how he got involved. But you know, so that was that was really kind of interesting going through those meetings because we it was kind of like this where we had Skype meetings yeah. and. Um, you know, he couldn't be on location, so he really didn't get an opportunity to see how things were going to play out until he got here. He didn't get to location scout, so we had to send him pictures and stuff like that. Um, but uh, and then we had different crew members. There was, I mean, we probably had three or four different camera operators and directors of photography. We shot on <clears throat> multiple different DSLRs, and um, so it was kind of it was kind of all over the place. Yeah. And we were just really getting our footing as far as uh, as far as putting the 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 film together. But at the same time, it was you know we were trying. I wouldn't. I, I won't say we were trying to do something new and fresh and yeah. and or anything like that. It was just a bunch of uh, fans of the genre getting together and saying, "Here's what we love about these horror films." Um, Here's here are the tropes that we don't like, and then or what tropes do we like, but maybe we can do a little bit differently so it doesn't feel like it's the same thing, just rehashed and and ultimately it it panned out. We we honestly didn't expect it to get the attention that it did. Um, 
I mean, I, I won't say it's like a, it, I won't say it's a cult classic or anything by by that any stretch of the imagination, but it um it, it did far exceed our expectations. So, so did you um did you self distribute that then, or did you? I mean, I I noticed that you went with uh, what is it? How do you say it? Petri or Petri Entertainment this time? Well, uh, the first with well with the first film we went through <clears throat> Legless Corpse. Okay. Um, the the sequel has been picked up by yeah Petri Entertainment okay yeah and uh, you know we we've we we bounced around the idea of doing self distribution and things of that nature um, I do have friends who who do that and uh, well the guy you know Justin from the barn and right you, right you John, see, you know, Jonathan with Night of Something Jonathan, Strange yeah, yeah exactly you know they they've been self distributing and and they've been doing it very successfully um, yeah. I. I mean, we we like I said, we had thrown the idea around, mm -hmm. but ultimately we just we weren't really that comfortable. We didn't um, we didn't plan ahead to mm -hmm. self distribute. Yeah. So yeah. honestly, it would have been more of a situation. I mean, we could have gone that route, mm -hmm. but it ultimately could have been digging ourselves into a financial hole. Yeah. Because you do you do have to plan ahead for that, so well, yeah. I mean, just just watching those guys, you know, they're you know they're in Horror Hound and they're at uh, you know Monster Palooza or Monster Mania or whatever. It's almost like a, I mean, it's definitely a full time job almost when you're self distributing. It feels like, and they you know they they've merchand they branded it almost their movies where they have merchandise yeah. and stuff and and I you know if you don't have a movie that you can basically brand I mean you branded volumes of blood I you know to an extent now you have your sequel coming out too so you could you could do it but you're right I mean it worries me too it's a ton of work you know that I guess that's a that's the new question all indie filmmakers have now yeah, I mean the uh, you know the land the landscape has changed a lot. Um, ironically, I was actually talking to Justin today about um, about this very topic of self distribution, and because like he and Jonathan had had met Adam Green mm -hmm. at what was Monster Blues, I believe, wasn't yeah. it this past weekend? Yeah, and and uh, you know they met Adam Green, and and uh, I guess he had had this big conversation with them about self distribution and and it's one of those situations where A, I'm super jealous because I love Adam Green and I would have yeah. really liked to have met him and picked his brain the way they got to. But, you know, it's like it immediately brings up some questions, you know, because Jason or Jason, Justin was saying, Well, you know, Adam says it's doable and he gave us you know some ideas as as how we how we can go about doing it and this that and the other and and immediately and it's not that I'm negative but I also tend to be a realist at the same time mm -hmm. and you know just doing a little bit of research like Adam came out of the gate with Hatchet yeah and it it was it's the movie that put him on the map and then you yeah, know forty he, million bucks or something like that it made right of course yeah. Right, you know, and then he did Spiral, and then there was Hatchet Two, and then there, you know, leading all the way up to. So he did five films that were distributed by very well-known, reputable distributors, and you know, maybe it didn't, you know, according according to him, or what I was told by their conversation, you know, it was he didn't see a whole lot of that return, yeah. and I've heard horror stories about that, but. But, but. <laughs> right, here's the but. <laughs> By the time Adam said, okay, I'm taking the reins and I'm going out there with digging up the marrow, mm -hmm. which he was, was a fantastic movie. I right. really oh, I love this. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I did too. I really liked I really liked it too. You know, Ray Wise was awesome in it. Yeah. And but the thing is, is like by the time Adam said, you know what, I'm taking over and I'm going to do it, he was like a household name in the yeah. horror industry. Mm -hmm. And at at that point you know, it's like he. I guess he had made the comment that really the only reason to go with distribution anymore is if you want to see your film in Walmart. Well, ironically, I bought Digging Up the Marrow at Walmart. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I think I got mine on like Amazon for like four bucks. <laughs> well, I'm one of those. I'm one of those people where I'm like, I've got to have it now. Okay. So, so I'm like twelve ninety nine. I can afford that. And. Uh, 
So, you know, so I bought the movie at Walmart. So at this point, he's in a place where he can get his films into the bigger, like big box stores because he's a name and he sells. He has a name that sells. Yeah. But then you take someone, and this is no offense to, to any of us, yeah. but you take, I'll use myself for instance, you know, Adam Green can take Digging Up the Marrow and go on a film tour and it's paid for, you know, by somebody. And ultimately he's going to make money taking this film around because it's Adam Green. People want to see his movie, yeah. be there and listen to him say something. And then he could self distribute that film. Now you take me. I'm PJ Starks. About this many people know who I am and <laughs> what I've done. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go on a tour and show volumes of blood horror stories. Yeah. More than likely, because I have, you know, a small following and, and I don't have that name that draws the limelight, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to lose my ass, you know? And it's so. But at the same time, I've never tried to do that. I mean, it could, you know, you could run into lightning in a bottle, and you could go out there and, and you know make a hit. At, you know, I could maybe I could take volumes of blood horror stories and go out on the road and make a make a ton of money. But you don't know until you do it. Yeah. But there's that part of me that says I'm not a master of horror. You know, I didn't make Hatchet. I didn't create a brand new horror icon so the chances of me self-distributing and doing it you know for a wide audience and doing it successfully and making a ton of money are, are is very slim yeah i sound like a party pooper <laughs> <laughs> hey i uh Just, you know i think self-distribution is, is a great way to it, 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 i would say at least try it I know I'm going to at least try it at some I'll, point. Yeah, I'll try it down the road too. I mean, we signed, you know, we turned over Bone Jangles to Wild Eye, um, but that was about a year ago already. So, uh, <laughs> and you know, it still hasn't been released. Okay, Wild Eye. <laughs> It'll come out eventually. Yeah, we were told quarter <laughs> two, but I think we uh, actually we just got the email this week with the official release date. Okay, um, cool. But we're just we're not allowed to, to talk about it yet, and they. Well, you know, and that was, see, that was one of the, the one, that was one of the reasons that we went with Petrie. Um, we had other distributors that were vying for the film. The and see that was that was the other thing that really kind of like made us really excited about this whole process because when we did the first volumes of Blood, <laughs> nobody gave two shits about the movie or like knew what it was or you know because we came out of the gate with it and it got all these amazing reviews but there was nobody like beating down our door trying to get their hands on it and uh you know I, it was mainly me reaching out trying to get people to grab onto this movie and we ultimately ended up landing um with legless but there but it was but it was more out of like necessity than because we had a ton of options mm -hmm. and but moving forward and then, you know, striking while the – I can't even think about what – I can't even uh, remember. The, yeah. Striking while the fire is hot. Is that is that right? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I had a major brain fart. <laughs> I think I just had a stroke actually. Um, but anyway, so we were like, okay, well, you know, is, is the first movie a fluke and we just happen to get lucky or do we really have something here? So we went out, went for it. Did the sequel and sent it out, and it, uh, for all intents and purposes, it got almost exactly the same reaction the first one did. It, you know, great reviews and lot, you know, everyone and you know that, that saw it at a screening loved it, and 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 at this point, because there was so much you know buzz going around on the different horror sites about the sequel, that opened up the door for more interest on. For the sequel, so that's why we ended up uh, being in the position where we actually got to choose who got the film, as opposed to having to choose someone because we didn't have a whole lot of options. Yeah. This time around, we had we had more options than what we anticipated, and uh, but we ended up going with Petrie because of going back to what you said a second ago. It was it kind of came down to the artistry of it. 
um, Andy Palmer and, and Warner Davis, the guys that run the company, they themselves are filmmakers and they understand where we're coming from and, and in a lot of ways, you know, how much hard work and everything that's put into it. And, mm -hmm. and you know, when you have a specific box art or a very specific name, you want to keep that name. Mm -hmm. um, we actually we actually got contacted by a dis distribution company that – we had our we had our meeting with them over the phone, and they had no idea that it was a sequel. Mm. They were they were like, "Oh, we were thinking about just calling it Volumes of Blood," and we're like, first one? <laughs> "Yeah, that's kind of what we said." We're like, "Well, that's a great idea, but um, so we we actually had to." tell them that it was a sequel and that there's already a volumes of blood and that you know and and so they did no research you know I, when i told them that like it was on fangoria's one of fangoria's top 10 best horror film films of 2016 and several others they were just like getting even more excited they're like oh really that's awesome that's fantastic and i'm thinking Shouldn't you already know this if you're talking about wanting to pick up the film? Yeah, that's a red red flag right there. Yeah, so that that kind of made our decision for us really quick. Um, but you know, like with Petrie, they they understood, and they had an idea of what they they saw the film, they loved the film, they you know they they understood what they had, they felt like they had something that was marketable. They didn't want to touch the name; it didn't make sense to them to touch the name. Um, and they 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 liked the box art, and and we're not opposed to changing the box art. Yeah, well, I mean, we weren't either. You know, I I understand wanting to get something that's eye catching, but at the same time, and, and see, that's what it comes down to. They're like, you know, they they get an independent film, and they say, this this isn't going to make us money. Because at the end of the day, for them, it is a business decision. It's all about the money. So they're like, we need to put buildings that are exploding, and we need to put, you know, like giant spiders coming up out of the ground, shooting missiles out of their legs. When there's no giant spiders in the movie at all. Right. You know, I mean, there. W I watched a movie, and I can't remember what the movie was, but it had fantastic box art. And it showed like this devastated uh, city, and it would just, it was like this post apocalyptic. Thing and I mean it was it looked so cool and then I got the movie and I thought they gave me the wrong disc because it was like on a farm and that's it like it's called Legend of Cooley Moon <laughs> <laughs> buy it now on Amazon really? directed by Brad Yeager <laughs> <laughs> don't trust the cover art shameful plug I know well <laughs> come on you were just talking about it what is that seriously what what is that the box art. Well, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to confirm or deny that. <laughs> There's a whole lot of not confirming yeah, or denying. Yeah. I, can't, I can't talk about that right now. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, so I mean, I, I, it just, I don't know. It, uh, it's, it is, it is a very weird business, mm -hmm. and it's funny because uh, Eric, who is, he's my partner in crime. He's. Uh, the other half of Blood Moon Pictures, and we recently got asked to come speak at the Country Club um, <laughs> about nice. about yeah about what we were doing to a group of people who were staring at us like horror films really yeah I just want to play golf and uh, someone asked me they said uh, you know what what are your what do you where do you see you your where do you see yourselves in ten years. And I started to give some like BS answer, and then finally I was like, you know what? I said, I, I, I said I'm not going to bullshit you. I mean, I said uh, I do I do this because I love to do this, and I'm passionate about it, and nobody else is doing it. And I was sick and tired of sitting around waiting for that someone to do it. So I finally picked up the reins and said, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't do this because I want to be a millionaire. I have no desire to run out to New York or L.A. and struggle with the tens of thousands of other people who run out to L.A. and New York and struggle and want to do this because I don't have to do that. I can do what I love here, and if I don't have an exorbitant budget 
that I think is going to fulfill my vision, I'll still find a way to do it. And I may not do it right now, but eventually I'll find a way to pull it off. And, you know, so, and there's so many other people who are interested in doing this. It's just right now is a really good time to network. But, you know, one of the, you know, anymore, it seems like how much money you have or how much money a film makes is based on its success. And I'm not a financial success. However, I am a guy who made an anthology film with a group of other filmmakers who are very like-minded and just as passionate mm-hmm. about doing this. And ultimately, it beca- it's become a franchise, and you know, there's tons of interest in it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I'm I've been told I'm like I've been I've actually been told I'm overexposed now. <laughs> because of all the interviews and things that I've done, those uh, those Polaroids will cost you forty bucks. Oh yeah, <laughs> fifty with an autograph. But uh, PayPal. <laughs> but you know, I, I just as far to me, Volumes of Blood is a success, hmm. not based off the fact that it's like a million dollar, you know, a um, hundred million dollar franchise. But because we as a group have all managed to get together and make something that we think is really cool and yeah. and thankfully everybody else agreed. And so that pushes me forward because I'm sure there's some people that are like, why would you be doing this if you're not making a whole lot of money? Yeah. Well, because that's not what it's about. Yeah. Maybe at, one, maybe at one time it was, but yeah. like I said, the landscape has changed. And maybe in, Maybe in a year or two you'll be wrecking in the dough. Maybe. I mean, I won't, I don't hate money. I would love to be a gazillionaire living in that spooky mansion that you live in. Yeah, well, <laughs> come on over. We have plenty of room for you in the basement. I'm on my way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and you know what I'm talking about because you, yeah. you've made a film now. Yeah, I made a couple. That's going to eventually – yeah, you've made a couple. That eventually, the second one's going to come out. <laughs> It may be another, it some, <laughs> sometime between now and 2025. Quarter, quarter three. Quarter three. <laughs> it's coming out. Actually, maybe uh, maybe quarter two in a couple weeks. Who knows? All right. And then I expect you to sign on to direct Knuckle Bones 2. Okay. So, fucking <laughs> Knuckle Bones. Okay. I, I'm sorry. Pardon my language. I'll tell you what. So, I, I watched that movie, and I, and I like it. But Knuckle Bones is the reason why Bone Jangles is not released yet. Are you serious? Dead serious. Yep. I have yep. not. I have not seen Knuckle Bones. Um, I did watch. Um, I'm friends with. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not like super close friends, but I'm Facebook friends with Jay and John from uh, Blood Bath and Beyond, and I actually watched their review of it, and they seemed overall to s- sort of enjoy it. So I am interested in seeing it. It's at uh, Family Video. I plan on yeah. at least renting it at some point. So when you're watching it, just know that it is probably the sole reason why Bone Jangles is not on the shelves yet. Is is that what Wild Eye has told you? Correct. Yes. Now, just out of curiosity, and this is – you know how like uh, when you come up with a concept or an idea and then – Somebody, you know, like you do bone jangles, yeah. and then someone else has come out and they do knuckle bones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are they similar in concept, or are they uh, completely different? The name just seems to be a little similar. Name similar, and they both have like this killer that's quirky and says weird shit when he's killing people. So like <laughs> uh, that, but that's it. I mean, it really is it. There's not much. So, That's um, why you watched the movie, isn't it? Because you wanted to see. Oh yeah, for how, sure. How, how similar they are. Well, you know, it's funny too because when we did the first, when we did the first volumes of Blood, we had people asking us like, "Why are you doing an anthology?" Because uh, a nobody gives a shit about anthologies, and two, I love anthologies. Anthologies don't. I love anthologies. I don't think they make enough anthologies, and or at least enough good ones. And you know, then then when we were out there like trying to push it, I, I got told several times that you know we made a mistake because anthologies don't sell. Mm. 
my reaction wow. was, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, wanted to make an anthology. Um, we were told uh, retro horror movies don't sell either, so we'll see. Yeah, I go back to the barn. Yeah, exactly. He seems to be doing pretty good. Yeah, that bastard. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He's been, I in like, like, he's been in like four hundred film festivals at this point. Well, that's what I, that's what I'm saying. Like. I think Bone Jangles has gotten rejected every single one in the cross, across the country. I think we've been blacklisted. <laughs> no, I actually I think you're Michael Bones. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Actually, I don't even. I think we applied. I think we entered it in like two film festivals or something like that. Well, see, film festivals. You know, it's a fu- it's funny because film festivals is another thing that that like so volumes of blood came out and it got like forty. To 60 glowing reviews and we thought holy crap you know we've really got the the festivals are going to eat this up so we spent like all this money sending them off sending the film off to festivals and i think uh, i think it was like we we submitted it to like 46 festivals and of the 46 that we submitted to it got accepted into 12 yeah and that was it. And then the remainder of the festivals that we got into were because I was friends with someone who ran the festival or I myself had direct ties to the festival. Mm-hmm. You know, it was that kind of a thing. So I immediately was like, I will never do this again. It's yeah. it's a huge waste of money. Mm-hmm. You know, but then you see films like The Barn and Night of Something Strange mm-hmm. both completely different. Both very good in their own, you know in their own ways, and they're just like just getting into like every festival, and yeah. I it really kind of like and I'm not I guess what it boils down to is that the barn and night of something strange are better movies than volumes of blood. That's <laughs> That is literally the only thing I can come up with. Either John and Justin are really good friends with a gazillion festivals. I think I think that's probably the truth. Is that's <laughs> how they got into everything? Is it they must just be. paid their way in? I think John, I tried to pay my way into these festivals and it didn't even work. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think Justin is having Zane's like sell his body. Yeah, <laughs> and that is how. <laughs> That's how. The, no, I don't want to take away from the merit from their no, film. They're, and they, those are great movies. Yeah, they they are. And, you know, and it's and it just. I guess part of it too is kind of like an artistic jealousy thing. I won't lie. I mean, we're all you know, we all have those those moments where we're like, why is it my movie getting into festivals? Yeah, but at the end of the day, you know, I just it's. It, the right time, the right festival, the right view, right, or right uh, reviewer from. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but I mean, yeah. it's it's awesome that they got into so many festivals. I wished I was able to somehow get our. It's you know, and it's funny. Volumes of Blood Horror Stories is the same way. I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you right now. We, um, I said I was never going to submit to another fe- festival and pay money to do it, and I. I managed to do that but we have submitted to 36 festivals all with waiver codes because i reached out to different festivals and i said hey here's this film and everybody really seems to like it um you know we have absolutely no uh like financial resources for submissions because we don't and you know the the film really what audiences it has played for it's done really well and it's also gotten a great reaction from the critics and here's the trailer if you want to check out the film let me know and i'll send it to you and so we ended up getting about 36 festivals who said sure we'll take a look at it mm-hmm. and it's been rejected by six of those so far yeah. <laughs> so so uh i don't, the, don't the know the competition is stiff though i mean yeah it's really tough yeah there's i mean there is a lot of really good independent films being made so it is it is uh I don't know. So, I mean, moving forward now, I mean, what projects do you have on the horizon? I mean, you and I talked briefly about a couple of them that, you know, opens up some collaboration or whatever. So just briefly talk about those. And Well, that, see, that, that was another really great thing about uh, the Volumes of Blood films. I mean, because it, it, it kind of helped 
to a degree establish us and give uh, you know give give me an opportunity to reach out because I, I like that's the whole reason I created Unscripted. It was the whole reason I started the film festivals because I like collaboration. It's the whole reason I wanted to do an anthology. I love working with other artists. I love working with other filmmakers. Um, so because the volumes of blood movies now have some clout, um, mm. it has given me the opportunity to reach out. And, you know, one of the things I've, I've, I've gotten pretty good at is like uh, marketing and PR. Mm. And so I'm able to help some other filmmakers get exposure for their projects. And uh, also, you know, I can give some creative advice and things of that nature. You know, it, it depends on how it works. But uh, so like right now I am, um, you know, serving as a producer in multiple different capacities for several other projects, one of which um, is Cryptids. Yeah. Which is a uh, which is a creature feature anthology, and it's all and the one thing that sold me on this project when I was talking to Justin um, was that all the monster effects were going to be done practical because I'm a huge practical effects guy. Yeah. The you know even going into like back to Volumes of Blood, the first movie we had one CGI effect, it was garbage. So going into the sequel, I was like, we're not doing any. We're doing all practical effects. So we have 26 on-screen practical kills. Um, and Cassandra Baker was our uh, was our uh, special effects supervisor, and she did an incredible job on all that. So, so when I was talking to Justin and we were talking about me working and on the on this project and helping out, the one thing that really sold me on it was the fact that it was an all practical effects monster movie so he and zane started showing me uh like photos and and some of the monsters that were being made um which you saw the goblin for i my did that, that yeah and zane had sent me that before you showed me that little right. that little clip zane had actually sent me that that same yeah. that same clip and i mean i just uh, it, it got me. Ex- it's it's gotten me excited. I mean, the there's you know all the stuff I've seen from that movie has really got me excited because I'm a big monster movie fan. Yeah. They don't once again they don't make enough monster movies, and in some cases not enough good monster movies. Um, so that was one of the reasons why I wanted to be a part of the project. So I you know I told him I was like, hey, if you'll have me, I'd love to be a part of the project and do what I can for you guys. And and so, so. what are you doing for? The, are you are are you doing a segment? No, I'm not doing a segment. Um, mainly, what I'm what I am helping with is is kind of the PR and the marketing. Gotcha. But uh, but that has not kicked in yet. Yeah. So right now it's mainly just you know I'm I'm occasionally Justin or Zane and I will talk about uh, you know certain parts of the. Like they'll send me something and say, hey, what do you think about this? That kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Um, so my 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 work on the film up to this point is is yeah. very minimal yeah. compared yeah. to when once you know it's time well, it'll to kick get, in. yeah once once it's really time to get out there and push the film and that kind of a thing that's when that's when I'll really start to go to work um, perfect and then let's see the other and I'm working on another anthology big surprise yeah, yeah. Um, and that one is uh, Rocky Gray his creation called 103116. I'm I'm doing my segment there too. I know it's <laughs> Jeez, small world. I know I should just produce every movie that you guys make. Yeah, well, I mean it makes sense. <laughs> Any movie that I'm involved with, you should be involved with. I, well. You know what? We're gonna make that happen. <clears throat> Let's do it. <laughs> even even moving forward on this top secret other anthology <sighs> we've talked oh. about, of of which I'll only do marketing and PR on, and then have everybody else do the hard work. Because that's how I roll. Sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm like I said, I'm filming uh, for that. I'm filming my segment in a couple weeks here up in Duluth, and uh, I don't know. Are you? And are you? Are you? Did I? I can't remember who I talked with about this. Was it Rocky? But yeah, the uh, Halloween Blizzard of 1991. Are you aware of that? The actual big, big, big blizzard. Of yes, yes, because. Um... I, I remember that vividly because I was with 
a friend of mine and his two sisters, we were trick-or-treating, and we went running in between two houses for a shortcut, Mm -hmm. and someone had taken fishing line and tied it to a fence and then oh. a, and then across over to a house like the gutter or something yeah. and I ran and hit the line and fell but they were right behind me so they all like plowed into me and it cut through my pants into my legs holy it was awesome <laughs> and it was snowing and it was Balls cold out, and yeah, I fell. Yeah. I fell like halfway down into the snow, but my lower half was still like straight up, and it cut it. It's it sucked, but yes, I do remember that. Well, I mean, can you believe that's been twenty five years? That was twenty five years ago already. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah, 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 it was. So okay, so we got uh, Rockies uh, ten thirty one ten thirty one sixteen. Once again, yeah. I was sold on that because it was uh, a an anthology, and he had sent me uh, an early draft of his script for the Sam Hain slasher, and I read that and I liked it, and I have <clears throat> I have tried to take a bigger role in that. I did write a script for a sequence and sent it to him. It was about a killer pumpkin. Nice. Or a killer jack-o'-lantern. He did not think it fit the tone for the rest of the film. <laughs> and uh, I went with an artsy-fartsy name. I called it Will, Will, Will of the Wisp is what I called it. <laughs> Don't make those faces. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway. Call him Willow, Willow for short. Maybe. I'll get Warwick Davis, and it'll be awesome. That he'll, will be awesome. He'll play the pumpkin. <laughs> so... So I wrote the script for it, and I was like, hey, I really like this. And I sent it his way, and I was like, if you don't like it, you can tell me. That's fine. And he wrote me back, and he didn't really say he didn't like it, but he did say that he didn't really feel like it fit the the tone for the film, which I guess it didn't because, you know, like Zane was telling me about his his concept, which I thought he had a really cool concept for his for his sequence, and. they're, they're, they're worlds apart. Like his is so much cooler than what my concept was. So, I, so I know why, why I lost. Um, so, yeah. What were we talking about? Oh, ten one sixteen. Yeah, I mean, so the barn. The barn. The barn. <laughs> Which I think is, I think Justin actually just he took the barn and he condensed it into a fifteen minute short, and he just sent that to Rocky, and that's going to be the sequence in ten thirty one sixteen. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> the freaking the barn, the, the burn. I'll tell you what you don't do. You don't write about a killer jack lantern. Okay, because Rock I says will. no. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, well, you know, it's and I, I guess I don't know if I, when I came up with the concept, I was just like, hey, I think this is a really cool concept. Um, I don't really remember exactly all what he said as far as like how it didn't fit into the film, but uh, I told him that's fine because it's going to now be in Volumes of Blood 3. I think that's exactly what you should do. And, and then you're going to have a sequence in Volumes of Blood 3 with a witch. Yep, yep, in a Victorian house, <laughs> not a barn. Is it a, the house you're sitting in right now? No. Okay. It's, it's a, uh, I, we're traveling up to Duluth to film this one. Duluth, oh, Minnesota. okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. But uh, but anyway, so going back to Rocky's movie, in all yeah. in all seriousness, I mean, it, it it is a cool concept. I you know, I love the whole Halloween vibe. I'm a big Halloween guy, mm-hmm. and uh, I just you know what when i read his when i read his story i thought it was really cool and you know i gave him some um it was it was an earlier script and then you know i kind of threw some ideas that i had some some pointers and stuff like that i don't know if he took any of them probably not cuz which is good because i wrote a story about a killer pumpkin yeah. and uh <laughs> <laughs> Rocky. Hey, we all have, we all have bad ideas every once in a while. Right? I've got a lot of them, apparently. But okay. uh, Rocky's a list of this. You. Oh, I, 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 you. I appreciate that. He's going to listen to this. He'd be like, "Wow, PJ really is bitter about that pumpkin not being in the." Uh, maybe I'll just make it a deleted scene or something. Yeah, well, I'm probably going to get fired from 10:31 <laughs> for making fun of Justin from the barn. 
I'll never work in <laughs> indie films again. Well, me and you will go to Monster Palooza next year. Done. But uh, but no, I'm I'm excited because I know it's you know it's Rocky's directorial debut. I'm really excited to yeah. see like you know what he's going to end up doing with the finished product once it's all put together and and you know I mean all, he's already an incra- like an insanely talented musician. Oh, for sure, yeah. And uh, you know he's he's still living on Evanescence money, so he doesn't even have to make this movie. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I love Evanescence, by the way. I actually, I, the, I, uh, the newer I went, stuff, I, not I, their old stuff. No, oh, not, <laughs> <laughs> not that ten years that yeah, Rocky yeah. was drumming. Yeah, not that. Yeah, you're mean. I, but I, uh, or, I actually love you, Rocky. You're great. Okay. Well, he, like I said, he's 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 an awesome musician, and then he you know he's done some fantastic scores. What he what he did uh, for Volumes of Blood, I fell in love with. I actually drive around, listen to it in my car, which is not weird whatsoever. No, it's not. And um, I listen to it while I take a shower. Yep, it's not weird at all. No, no, I'm listening to it right now. Da, 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 da. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so yeah, so I am excited about that project. Um, let's see, moving on to the next. Yeah, uh, I I'm actually I want to know more about what projects I'm going to get involved with because <laughs> this is <laughs> I'm just going to like weasel my way into every project. Hey, that's what I do. I made I made volumes of blood. And now that gives me the opportunity to do some weaseling. But uh, the the next one is uh, it's called Demosamine, which I had a hard time pronouncing at first. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of a like a drug induced demonic horror type film about uh, it's it's like a hallucinogen it, it's really out there and weird and psychedelic mm-hmm. and uh, it's actually it's direct, written and directed by Chad Armstrong who incidentally is also the uh, owner of uh, or co-owner of Legless Corpse Films who who uh, who distributed the first volumes of blood and uh chad's a really cool guy and we obviously have talked a whole lot uh not just about you know the whole volumes of blood business stuff but also you know other films and projects and things and um he he's once he also has done a lot of like practical makeup and and things for uh for Demosamine, and I mean, it, it has Jim O'Rear is in it. Jim was in the first Volumes of Blood, did some voiceover work for the second, and uh, he he plays a this demonic mailman type character in Demosamine. So it's uh, if you haven't checked out the there's like a teaser teaser trailer for it. So if you get an opportunity, you should check it out. It's it's lots there's lots of bloodshed in this movie. So I'm 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 excited for it to come out, and it's. My role in that is very similar to the, you know, he and I have talked a lot about, you know, it's creative type stuff. Then also I'm going to help him with some, you know, PR and marketing and things. Not that he needs a whole lot of that because, you know, that's what they do. Mm. But uh, I'm just excited to be helping out with that. And then the other project that I've been helping out with is uh, Close Calls, which was written and directed by Richard Stringham. And uh, I have no idea who that is. Well, you should. <laughs> you should stop obsessing over Justin from I, the barn. The barn. And uh, and and start f- it's creeping on all these other filmmakers <laughs> who are doing stuff out there. But no, he. Uh, this this is. Uh, if you get an opportunity, it too has a, a teaser trailer, and then more of a, uh, like a, it's got its first its first full trailers out there. But uh, Greg Fallon in is is in it. Uh, Jordan Phipps. Oh, Greg Fallon. Yes. <laughs> and uh, no, but uh, I'm trying to remember how I got connected with him. I I think uh, it was through it was through Rocky actually. <laughs> ironically enough but uh he he had richard had gotten the movie done and uh needed once again he he was really trying to to push the film get it more exposure and and he needed some help with that so rocky sent him my way and we sat down and came up with uh you know like some marketing plans and stuff like that and and uh we've since gotten the film out there i mean the the when you see the trailer you'll you'll understand i mean it, it's 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 got this really 
it's kind of a throwback film too, but it's it it's yeah. it's a throwback to a lot of those like uh, you know uh, like when a stranger calls. So okay. there, it's yeah. more there's I mean there's some in your face moments, but also yeah. it's 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 kind of a slow burn as well. So. When you see the trailer, you'll know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's right it's uh, it's it's pretty cool, and I'm 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 it's 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 already finished. They're in the they're at the tail end of post production, mm-hmm. so I mean they're they're weeks out from having a, a finished film. Okay. So so that'll be coming out here pretty soon, and then the the other ones are still in production. Yeah. As you know, because you're 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 making a couple segments in two of them. Hey, I like it. Yes. Yes. Just the way I like it. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, well, you know, it was really exciting uh, to be able to chat with you about your projects because I kind of feel like Volumes of Blood has, like, exploded onto the scene and <clears throat> your name, I actually knew your name before I even ever talked to you, you know, so... It, you're doing something right, so definitely keep it up. Thank you. You know, <laughs> and your your personality is exactly how I envisioned it would be, like super laid back, <laughs> super friendly. Um, I you know, I try. No, it's great, and uh, I appreciate you coming on and doing this podcast. And you know, I'm ex- super excited for the collaboration that we have coming up. A lot of good projects. Where can I get Volumes of Blood? The first Volumes of Blood you can yeah. get uh, if you are so inclined. You can go to uh, legglesscorpsefilms.com and get them directly from the source. You can also get it via um, Amazon if you have a Prime account. You can actually watch. Do. You do have one? Yes. Well, you can watch it for free. I would rather hold it in my hands. Well, you can also order a physical copy from Legless or Amazon. Perfect. They've got Blu-rays and DVDs, a special Steelbook edition. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Uh, okay. If you get the Steelbook edition, it comes with a uh, a uh, oh what the the lobby cards. Ooh. Because nice. uh, we had uh, Nathan actually made lobby cards for the film, which was pretty cool. That's awesome. I'm gonna buy it. Support uh, indie films. Support yes. PJ Starks so he can make uh, another kick-ass uh, anthology. And support Brett so he can make Knucklebones too. 